Welcome. Uh, Peter Bergen, uh, the director of the International Security Program, that's me. We are at the New America Foundation, that's where you are. Uh, we have a superb panel to discuss uh, the Afghan election, which as you know will be held on Saturday. Um, Faisal Ali Khan, to my immediate left, is a Carnegie Fellow at New America. He just recently arrived for a six-week fellowship here. Uh, Faisal has also just uh, spent uh, about a month traveling around Afghanistan meeting with candidates. And so he's going to have a sort of report from the field uh, based on his recent reporting trip. Um, Faisal is actually a Pakistani citizen uh, from Dera Ismail Khan, which is on the border of South Waziristan and what used to be called the Northwest Frontier Province, now Khyber Pukhtunwa. Uh, he uh, runs a, uh, the Foundation for Integrated Development Action, which does work in the federally administered tribal areas to uh, get youth to uh, kind of take another option other than joining the Taliban. He's also an entrepreneur who runs uh, businesses between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Very ha happy to have you here, Faisal. Uh, next is Claire Lockhart, who is the CEO for the Institute of State Effectiveness, and as you know, has played a instrumental role in uh, many of the uh, working in Afghanistan, helping the government think through how to become more effective, worked with one of the leading candidates uh, in the election, uh, Ashraf Ghani, as an advisor for many years. And to her uh, left is Ambassador Omar Samad, who's had a distinguished career in the Afghan government. He's a fellow here at the New America Foundation. He was ambassador to France for Afghanistan. He was also ambassador to Canada, uh, played a very critical role there. Uh, Canada's biggest, uh, I think, overseas deployment since the Korean War uh, was in Afghanistan. Um, and he was also spokesman uh, for the foreign ministry uh, before that. And uh, welcome to you all. And we'll start with Faisal. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, Peter Bergen, for having me here at the New America Foundation. Um, I'm just going to start with a short video clip to, um, you know, set the mood for the election of, you know, some of the things that I saw uh, during this trip. So that was just something that was a few local journalists helped me put together and edit some of the bits from what I what I'd seen and you know the very active involvement of of the media as you saw. Um, the um, I just before before I start I just like to say that it's I've if there's anything that's been left out um, from this presentation is because of the in the interest of time it's not because it's not relevant or as important because it's, it's such a vast and complex subject it's very difficult to put it all and you know capture everything in there so I apologize if anything's missed out um, going to some of the candidates I mean, we'll talk about the three main front runners at the moment right now but you know it was interesting to me to have people like Daud Sultanzai and people who aren't coming from your traditional political or you know class or people who've been power players in different provinces and districts. I found that in Afghanistan um, there's so much of um, regional expertise. It's very difficult having a national sort of uh, frame of what's going on. Things are constantly changing and evolving, and it's a lot easier being able to see you know focusing on a particular area as opposed to the the country as a as a whole. 
Um, although Ustad Sayaf is not a front runner, the reason I put him put him here is I was very struck by th what you just saw in the video there at the first event at the Loya Jirga tent, the same place where you know during the civil war his troops had come and killed thousands of people is where he chose to have his inaugural event. Um, there were about two three hundred armed people in Kabul from his militia all over the place around there, and as you saw in that video. Uh, you know, and I, I looked around at the crowd, and you see all these people, former Mujahideen, you know, big guys with long hair, beards, sort of what one has an image of, you know, the militants. And he walks up on the stage, as you saw, and everybody sort of puts their hand like this, and he goes and stands there. And he's the most vocal person who's speaking against the Taliban. And he says, you know, I'm going to go to every province, and I'm going to stamp this out, and those traitors who work on behalf of the neighboring countries, I will do this and I will do that. And when I look around and I see the people and I was talking to people at the naan shop where they have stickers of him, they were all saying that, you know, this guy, at least we know what, thing, what, what things would be like under his time. It might be very difficult, it might be very strained, but it's a known entity. And he's someone who looks like he has the authority and power to be able to do something about something. Although, as you see, he, he's not really a major player, but I just found that was an interesting thing that I'd come across, um, you know, in someone like him. Zalmi Rasul, I think, going forward in this, at this venture where we are now, if we go into the politics of it, I think a lot of people feel that there probably will be a second round after the 5th of April. Um, I was speaking to some people this morning as well, and it seems that everyone is geared up for Saturday for the election to take place. Um, if there is a second round, I think then somebody like Zalmi Rasul would probably be potentially someone who could work with either of the other two. That is, you know, Dr. Ashraf uh, Ghani or uh, Abdullah Abdullah. And um, I see him as somebody that represents the interests of the current administration, not only in the president, but also some of the people around him in order for them to at least uh, remain somewhat relevant or be able to protect interests that have been created over this last decade or so. Um, Ashraf Ghani was a very interesting sort of campaign. I mean, this is something that came off to a bit of a slow start in the public eye, although I think he'd been at it after his last... Um, presidential bid. He was part of the Kabul process where he was going out and having engagement all across the country, meeting with various communities and people and keeping up that momentum. So he's someone he's seen to be a following through a certain process all the way till now, um, where he's been able to communicate his message nationally. And something that people have been able to gravitate towards and it's taken on a bit of a life of its own. A lot of people felt that having a combination of Dr. Ghani with uh, General Dostam over there would be, you know, a sure shot loss, and he's not going to go anywhere with this. But it's something that's gained a lot of momentum, and he's seen um, you know, as someone who won't bow down to regional interests, meaning he's not associated with any particular neighbor, who will have a strong position with the West, who has a plan, who, who's not sort of seen as corrupt, and doesn't have a coterie around him. He's not someone who comes with a large extended group of people around him that would be potential beneficiaries of his administration. So I think those are all things I think which in reaction um, at this time after having an administration for 10 years is something which, you know, gives him a lot of appeal across a lot of people. Um, Dostum, I think, my view of this on, when you're looking at it from the political side is more being an asset to him than being a liability. <coughs> And the reason I say this is people used to, I heard people saying that, you know, having someone like General Dostum will mean that the South is gone. He's not going to get anything in the South because of the atrocities created. My take is that all politics is local at the end of the day. In any country, it's all about local issues and local things. When you have a president from the South, like we've had, somebody who's had a stake in tribal connections, etc. I mean, I'll, the small example I'll give you is of Zabul. Back in, you know, the uh, 94, time of the Taliban, etc., there was a gentleman by the name of Hamidullah Tohi, who was an ex hizb commander of Hikmat Yar group, very close to the president, etc. This was a man who had been humiliated by the Taliban, paraded on the streets because of corruption, looting, etc., and people were very happy when the Taliban took over. When President Karzai took over, this man, Hamidullah Tohi, was the first governor of Zabul. He was uh, over there, you know, the same person who had done this thing. A lot of the People who are, you know, the Talibs in that area, um, people like Amir Khan Haqqani, Mullah Nazir, Malvi Abdul Qayyum, people who've been close to the Quetta Shura, etc., who at the time uh, President Karzai had announced an amnesty for Taliban to put on their arms, they were willing to sort of step aside. But then when you have someone like this put in, who you paraded across the streets, 
obviously that changes the entire dynamic. Similarly, what I'm trying to say is that when you have someone from the South who's in power sometimes, when you get into the power plays of the tribal politics, it means that there's always going to be someone who's benefiting in a particular district or not, who's going to be the police chief, who's the NDS, chief, NDS person, you know, things like that. I think someone like uh, um, a, a Ghani Dostum combination is viewed at uh, if there's going to be an influence by General Dostum, it's going to be in the north, it's going to be something that will affect people like Atam Ahmad Noor and others, it's not going to affect me over here in the south. And Dr. Ghani is not a man who has that kind of micro linkages and relationships where he will be able to put this Alok Zai person here or this Barak Zai versus this Ishak Zai or things in this, in this nature. I'm just talking in terms of perception of something that I came across and saw as something interesting. Abdullah Abdullah, I mean, because of um, the death of Marshal Fahim, you know, there's been a bit of a break in, you know, his public movements, etc. But he's been on the campaign since the last election. I mean, he's been going strong since that time. He clearly has a huge popular base and support all across the country. It's a fallacy that people say that people in the South don't support him. Mullah Naqib's son, Kalimullah, many other people who, um, you know, are strong people in the South of the country also have been supporters of uh, Abdullah Abdullah. The fact that one section of Hizb Islam is also, you know, supporting him uh, in this election. I mean, all of these things are going to contribute. And I mean, he is someone who is, you know, a much larger than life sort of player. I think he also knows that all politics and this particular election again comes back to local, which is why one of the things he's been going and saying everywhere is that we're going to have direct election of governors and, you know, things, things of that nature. The role of the media and the youth. I mean, this is something that I found really quite incredible. You have this sort of nationalistic, um, you know, very sort of driven, motivated youth that make up a lot of what the media is, that make up a lot of sort of civil society, people around, you know, sort of everywhere, um, really having a huge impact on what's happening and, you know, framing the sort of debates as well as some of the things um, over here. In Herat, I saw there's a huge, massive, you know, journalism school, you know, uh, thanks to USAID's uh, assistance, a lot of people who have been motivated and wanting to become journalists and go into this, being able to highlight issues which are off the screen. This young boy here, he was a poor fellow, a gang rape victim whose mother had taken him to the police station and no one was registering any cases against him and they brought him to the media and, you know, because the media highlighted the issue, it suddenly... Uh, you know, allowed him to sort of get some sort of resolve. Here we have, you know, youth conferences going on trying to address the brain drain. Groups like Afghan 1400, where they're trying to take uh, the mandate of the young people to a candidate and have a consolidated sort of view of, you know, these are the things that we want. So I really see that as something very positive. These recent attacks, I think, have contributed to building that sort of unity amongst people, um, a stronger resolve to push back and for people to come out in the election and to cast their vote and demonstrate their intent. Um, so all of these things are things which I think are very positive. A point here that before I forget something I came across recently, there's this, some articles that have come out about these 21 million vote cards instead of 10 million or 12 million. And you know, what does this mean in terms of corruption? I mean, a lot of people, there's a huge movement over here of peoples. People who voted in a provincial election in Mazar today might be sitting in Kabul. So, you know, there's a lot of things where um, just because of movements of people and local conditions, there might be, you know, things like that that have happened. They don't necessarily mean that this is because, you know, there's, there's something more sinister to it. Sometimes it's just something that's more just administrative. On the positive side, I mean, I went to uh, see the Kapisa governor. You know, here you have two particular districts which are under control of, you know, anti-state actors. Yet, they're sitting over there, they were doing a plan for what happens, you know, next. Um, I saw in the Ministry of Education this political culture that's developed. I saw local people going with MPs holding their hands and going here and there to get a teacher transferred or somebody appointed. I saw people in ministries going to get taxi permits with their MP. Mean to say that now there's some access to the center. If you're someone sitting in a far-flung district, you can catch your MP and go to the center and try and get some resolution of what you want to do. And these MPs are going to play a role in this election. MPs are supporting various candidates. So different candidates who are there, I mean, they have this sort of machine behind them also. When it comes down to the election, there'll be people who know how to do the mechanics of the election. What happens with transport? What happens with denying transport? What happens with who you get to which polling station? You know, there's a mechanics, mechanics aspect of the election, which is something that's an imperative thing that makes, you know, one win versus another. Um, 
On that uh, point, again, when you talk about the extent of the state machinery and you see what sort of influence would that have on an election like this, uh, my opinion is when you've had someone who's been there for 10 years, he's not going to be there going forward. That's going to have a ma an impact on an NDS chief, someone sitting in Balkh or, you know, sitting in the south of the country. I think they will probably look at what's going to happen next, who's going to be the next people coming in, and where do I create my alliance, or who are the power brokers in the local area. So I think it's something that will possibly get dissipated that if there is any sort of uh, involvement or any sort of uh, you know, reach of the state, which I don't really think is something that will happen in this election because of the kind of feeling there is and the amount, I mean, there are 10,000 monitors now. People are very enthusiastic. You know, there's this whole sort of move. But if there is something like that, I, got, I think the person who's sitting in bulk in terms of a government official, his decisions or what he does are not going to be governed by Kabul. Similarly, someone sitting in Helmand or in Zabul or, you know, in, in Faram. So that's something that I think is also, uh, you know, I wanted to bring to your attention. In Herat, I saw that the governor who had been in Konar previously was bringing in accountability amongst the police. If you're talking about bribes and things like that, he'd imprison people from the police in prison. I mean, it's showing that in local areas, local governments, there is a way to sort of fight back and send a message of, you know, there being relative sort of stability or, you know, having uh, ways that one can, you know, do something about. Um, this young man here, Abu Muslim, he's 24 years old. He's one of the main anchor pers persons in, uh, in Afghanistan with uh, Tolo, one of the largest channels. And I was surprised when I see him talking to governors, talking to people like Ustad Siaf and all these people and the questions he's asking and the things he's saying. I told him, I said, are you crazy that you're asking these kind of questions? I mean, tomorrow you'll be hung up somewhere. And he said, no, you know, things have started to change now. There's more of a capacity for this. And I think these things have also impacted the way that these people are looking at youth. A lot of people say, I see a lot of the same old faces. What's changed? Yes, you see the same faces, but they're going out to the public now. They're having a different interaction with the public. They're talking about women. They're talking with these young people. A young person is getting up and saying something which he'd never ever say in his life before. And now today you're seeing something like that. So I think all of these things are changed. This young man up here in the tent is a young MP who uh, came from Kabul. And he uh, you know, was staging a sit-in outside the parliament because he was demanding that the president recognize all the fallen troops from the Afghan National Army, from the police who've died as victims of terrorism, etc., that their families are met. All the presidential candidates were going to see him. Um, you know, it, it created a big stir. He's a young guy, not coming from any wealth or you know, anything like that. He actually used to work at Tolu. And I think people like that coming up, raising these kind of questions, you know, having those kind of messages is something that really demonstrates all the positive changes that are taking place. Um, the NSP is something I've followed very closely, the National Solidarity Program. I think it's one of the few things that has been able to penetrate the provable sort of mud curtain of Afghanistan, where the Ashuras initially were things which were an alternative to the power structures, but now you've seen so many ministers, MPs, local uh, structures getting integrated with NSP um, and having an ability to do something about things for themselves with the grants they get, etc. So it's something that anybody I met, everywhere I went, everyone had good things to say about. In Kapis, I was surprised to see, I myself am fond of uh, hunting, and I was surprised to see there's duck decoys, mallards, scoots, anything you can imagine, and, you know, fishing gear and everything else, which shows, like, in some degree, there's some normalcy where people have the time to go fishing and to go do it for a duck shoot or something, you know, in the time with everything that's been happening. Uh, so that was something that was, uh, you know, quite a, quite a surprise to me. Here I'd like to just go into the challenge of the frame. One of the things that really uh, impacted me on this visit is I realized that you can't look at this election from 2001 to now. I was not able to understand when I was looking at this frame. When I spoke to people, particularly in far-flung rural areas where there's limited access to media, etc., that man is taking his frame from the traditional way, what he's heard, what he's seen, you know, the old views. And then you get this sort of panoramic vision of what's happening. They start seeing that from the time of King Abdul Rahman, what was the vision and what was the thinking where he wanted no railroad to be made because he said, if I create some economic interest in this country, then people are going to come and, you know, other foreign powers are going to come and try and interfere in this place. You see that in 1919, people like King Amanullah, when he tried to do all this reform of take off the veil, everyone wear Western clothes in Kabul, like do some of the things that we now relate to some of the progress or changes that we see from a Western prison. This was all done in, at, at that time. 
it was all fragmented. You had a person, this Basha Sako, who comes to power for nine months with a group of illiterate ministers, you know, in reaction to all these reforms. You have then transition with Nader Shah. You have a time where you have the British supporting one person. You have, uh, you know, Amanullah, King Amanullah, trying to be supported by the Russians. What I mean is, I'm talking of multiple transition, transitions with um, foreign intervention sort of powers also that have been taking place historically within this frame of this last hundred years. The thing which I find interesting is from 1931 when they started the parliamentary elections and Nader Shah's time and then with King Zahir Shah, from 49 to 52, you had, an ele you had uh, the Seventh National Assembly where out of the 120 legislators, you had about 40 people who were from liberal backgrounds, who were trying to address corruption with ministers, who were trying to bring some sort of reform. And these people, in on the 52 election, there were three newspapers that were banned. They started questioning the Muslim religion. They started questioning the, the monarchy. I mean, it was going, there was land reform that was going totally ridiculous. And that's when, in 1953, you had Daud come back. And for 10 years, you had a rule. So what I'm saying is, when we're looking at the development in, in terms of democratically, democracy, even compared to Pakistan, I mean, we weren't even in existence when they'd already developed to this certain level, you know, in Afghanistan, in terms of parliamentary elections, culture, etc. I relate this period of 53 and 63 to what we're seeing now. You had a rule for 10 years, like we've had now, of one particular group. In that 10 years, there was a lot of economic growth, etc. There were a lot of young people that were trained. They wanted decision making in the country's affairs. This one man rule was becoming something that was inefficient and unproductive and unpopular after so long. There was nepotism, etc. So that's why when King Zahir Shah asked someone like uh, Sardar Dao to step down, even though he had the support of the USSR and the support of the army, he stepped down because he also saw the writing on the wall that there's a fatigue after a 10 year period. And in this election, I see the same thing. There's a fatigue. It doesn't matter who's come on what they've done. It's a long time. People want to see what happens next. And that's why I feel that across the country, there's, there is this feeling for change and wanting to look at, you know, what happens next. Um, I think we can't sort of address this uh, also without looking at what I call the tribal prism. When you're looking at it from the point of view of the Kabyle, in the tribal mind, there's a different way that people are looking and viewing things that are happening or, this, or the, the situation. Um, I wrote something. I'm going to give you a little story of Helmand also. But I wrote a little something just to help uh, put this sort of mindset. It's on a, this kind of paper towel type of parchment at night. One day I was sitting and going over this trip and it came in my mind. So this is just to give you any of you who have experienced people in these areas and who go in the mindset of how people in the Kabyle are looking at things. I think you'd appreciate and in the language, forgive the language because it's the way that people communicate. But um, what I'm saying here is, with my tribal prism, I must widen the lens to see 100 years back and 20 years ahead. I recognize my position as a pawn, destined to a life between great powers, colliding from my vantage point perched on the mountain. You know, in this large surroundings, far from this suffocating cage, gilded cage of my tribal life, which is a restrictive thing, where no decision belongs to anyone but mother compromise, where the stifling of individual thought forces my assertion of authority on my women, children, beasts of burden, allowing me to remain anchored and survive the constantly shifting ground beneath me. The Taliban and occupation forces attempt to cloak my vision and force themselves upon me, in me, violating everything I hold dear, attempting to break the bond with my ancestors' collective wisdom that we've lived by, contributed to, and have been custodians for our children. Can you imagine living in a time like this, constantly shifting realities, the helplessness and inability to affect any change around you, the pain of watching everything you hold dear being ripped from your arms? You ask me to be rational and adhere to alien arbitrary laws that have never been able to take root in the land that I live in? You ask me to think of a future when I'm barely early able to live today? Afghanistan is a great country and a testament of our times that the indomitable spirit of man cannot be stamped out by the greatest of empires. These are the kind of rhetoric and talks and things you hear in the hujras. These are the kind of things you hear when you go and you sit in the evening and people are having the cups of tea. This is the kind of thing that you hear in some of these places. The glorification, the views, the old, you know, something of the way that they see themselves and where they're going. In Helmand, 
you know, it's an area where there's been such a large insurgency. One of the propagandas that, you know, you hear from people is saying that the British are avenging their forefathers in the Battle of Mehwan, what happened then, that's happening now. There's all this talk about the insurgency, etc. I put it all down to one thing. In tribal area, you have like what we call, you know, there's uh, Zar Zameen and Zanen, like the, the, there's either the land or the gold or the women. Over here, it's a matter of land, it's a matter of opium, it's a matter of water when you come to a place like this. This is the breadbasket of the country. This is a place where you have most of the agricultural base. This is a place that in 1946, when the Afghan had a surplus of foreign exchange from war inflated prices to allied forces, they actually commissioned a company from Boise, Idaho to come and do the Hellman Valley project. $17 million contract it was. It's another thing that it went into cost overruns to 50 million and the Americans didn't go for 30 years. But the thing is that they brought about a lot of prosperity. At that time, the Durrani Empire had all these Pashtuns that had been settled there. You had the Khan and the Khawaneen. You had people who are sitting as patrons of the state, proxies to the center, arbitrating, etc. Suddenly you have all these people coming from all over to benefit from the agriculture, etc. You upset the local balance. You have people like these Akhun Zadas who start coming up and benefiting from this. You have in the 80s poppy cultivation happening. Why? Let me just, just a short thing here which is important to understand. Here you have people with land, large land holdings who appoint tenant farmers. Tenant farmer has a small land holding. If you ask him to make a water pump and to try and take the goods to market and seed, etc., he, he can't afford to do such a thing like this. So the poppy and things like that is just a matter of income, which is being denied to him. So here, I think in a place like this, it's really about land. I think in a place like this, it's people who were supported by this administration. People like the Akhun Zada, Shir Ali, who came as the first governor over here, Amir Dado, who you had in NDS. I mean, many of the people who came in the helm of affairs were people where the main tribe that make up the Taliban were left out of power. In Pakistani politics and tribal thing, when you're trying to break somebody, you put his own cousins and all in power and you try and cut them. Here, the whole tribe was kept out. So here you have, you know, Barakzai's are there, you have this Alokzai, you know, you have different people who've come and you're playing tribal politics. And I think those are things which impact heavily, these micro-conflicts impact the national conflict. They blow things up. And which is why I see that, you know, going forward, it makes it very difficult for an occupation force or a foreign interventionist to change some of these things or to bring some peace uh, to some of these kind of, uh, you know, elements. The withdrawal. What does the withdrawal mean? Sorry, I'm making a bit of a mess over here with all these papers. But um, the withdrawal is something that I think, with people that I've spoken with, a smaller footprint will be beneficial. I think they're established intelligence channels. There's a competent uh, you know, no, local uh, uh, force in terms of army, police, etc. I think that it can't be Afghan-led unless they're taking decisions and dealing with consequences. You often say Afghan-led, but you're taking decisions yourself about things on the ground. You know? Then I think this will force a real economy to develop, not a war economy. You know, it'll face, it'll make people want to do things you know, around in the area. I think it'll be a major blow to the insurgency as occupation forces are a major motivational tool to people. And after 10 years, with such a large footprint, what real benefit is there really? of continuing to have troops in some of these areas. Are they just fueling this insurgency? And what would the impact be of them not being there? And if you put the Afghan people in front without the back of the international forces, what will be their way of trying to bring some resolve in their local areas? Will it impact their decisions? So I think these are all things which are important for us to consider um, and look at. The Taliban. I think you know this is a group that has gone through a lot of evolution. On a, on a very wide scale, I would say, whoever the next president is, he should hold direct talks with the Taliban. No need for some Doha, some Qatar, some Norwegian, German, this thing, that thing. It's Afghan. You call the people, you sit and you have direct discussion with, with the people. My own feeling is that people like Mullah Umar and this Qatar Shura, the old guard, are really the last hope to bring about some peace because I really don't think that they have the same level of control that people think they have or that they try and project. This new younger lot that you have, you have commanders who are 25 years old commanding a group of 20, 30 soldiers all across the place. Communication is limited. They have financial independence. When your own child gains financial independence and is doing something, you know, there's a change in the way that they look at you and the attitude and everything else, okay? So here, it's a different kind of dynamic. These are not people who've been fighting shoulder to shoulder with these Taliban and the glory, glory days. This is a young 20-year-old, 25-year-old. His vision and what he sees 
these bunch of old guys who want to do this and want to do that, who are they? What's their relevance to me? What have they done? They're sitting somewhere, enjoying life, and I'm the guy who's suffering on the ground. So I think, you know, this aspect is something that is something that one should be very wary of, that who exactly are we talking to? And it will expose some of the beneficiaries who are prolonging the conflict. When you look at Taliban also, I would say this last 10 years, just like we look at Karzai in terms of fatigue of government, in some areas you'll see a fatigue from Taliban. The places where they're taking the taxes, where they're taking the chanda and the mosque, they've been present. They've been in governance in some sort of way. So when people have a choice, there might be a rejection of both in some of these places, if the option is strong enough. So I think those are also things which you know, are there to consider. Things like you know, on a local level, when there's a well-known commander and he's killed, the next guy takes on his same name. These are all signs that show that they're holding on to something very dearly. I mean, why do you take on the name of the same commander and try and keep that image going and all that kind of thing, you know? In terms of the shadow administrations, it's something that you, we've seen that's there. There's very strong intelligence. They take big advantage of the tribal uh, disenfranchisement. You know, this underworld thing where belonging, whichever tribe you are, you're able to mobilize other people with you. Um, the financial independence, gaining from local corruption of, you know, Afghan police forces and things of that nature. So these are all things, I think, which have fueled it till this stage. But I really wouldn't say that they're a popular option or a unified sort of group in the country. The role of Pakistan, you know, I mean, this is very important, especially coming after this last slide. Um, I think that there's now an existential, sorry if I say that wrong, threat to the country in Pakistan. I relate this to in 1931 when Nadir Shah came to power in Afghanistan. This is a time when for 15 years there was an insurgency going on in Central Asian countries where Afghanistan had given, you know, to, to the Khan of Khiva and Amir of Bukhara over here and this Badkashi movement was going on. Nadir Shah came, he had so many domestic issues, he said, you know, the hell with all this. In one year, this 15-year movement was gone, finished. The Red Army couldn't stamp it out in 15 years, in one year it was gone. Here we have a problem where you have groups questioning our existence our constitution, killing our troops, killing our children, killing everybody that you can think of, me whether it's media, whether it's you know, police, whether it's civilian, whether it's politician. So I think in the country, there's a lot of sort of resolve to try and address this issue because now it's affecting the very existence of who we stand for. I think we almost had a run in into a North Pakistan operation because you had a new army chief who came to power who wasn't someone coming from a background with intelligence, etc., who would think, what will they say, what will so-and-so say? Somebody did this and you do this, you know. They blocked off all the areas. There was assassination of key commanders and it demonstrated that there was going to be some change. But then the politicians stepped in. The politicians stepped in because there's politics at play. The PMLN wanted to make PTI and Imran Khan look bad and say, you want to have talks? Here you have the talks. There's no resolve behind the talks. When you're having talks in context of tribal or in conflict, there has to be some integrity in the process. Who are the people that you're appointing to have these talks on your behalf? You're an established government. You can't have a couple of, you know, yahoos who are there to represent you going up to the mountain. I mean, it's, it's totally ridiculous. I think it's just a delay before the inevitable that will happen. I think for Pakistan, a strong Afghanistan-Pakistan relationship is important to counter Iran. Um, and what I'm going to bring in here a little bit later, Russia um, and some of the other challenges in the region. Um, I think that with the U.S. role, you made it very clear who you support in Pakistan. From 1954, before we were even 10 years old, you gave $21 million to the Pakistan Army in military assistance. That was a time when in Kabul, they were paving the streets, the Russians, and making cement plants and everything else, right? During Zainal Ziyar's time, you say, I always come across people say, you did this about the Mujahideen. My most populist leader, Zafrik Ali Bhutto, when he came to power in 78, you took him, hung him, you bring a dictator who's lashing women, creating this co coercive sort of feeling. And in those 10 years, you're doing this operation with the Pakistani civilians mouth shut during this whole time. You didn't ask us. So whatever it is, the Pakistan army today is the custodian of the federation. The Pakistani politician, Afghanistan is not relevant to him because you've never allowed it to be from the very beginning. He doesn't have those links. He doesn't have those relationships and things anymore. I'm not looking at provincial things like ANP, but generally speaking, there isn't that sort of connectivity. These are all things we need to change. These are all things we have to do something about. And we have to recognize that without Pakistan in this particular scenario and um, you know, changing the frame, it's very important to come to some sort of peace in this region and having this, and I'm telling you that it's really in the interest now of the country since it's our own uh, issue of our own national interest. The vacuum. What happens next? 
For me, it's very hard to fathom that, you know, from the time when Habibullah's murder has been linked with Soviets, from 1920 when they started giving aid to Afghanistan, from $100 million grants, to all the things that have happened, alternative gas pipelines, every time there's been some close relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan in 1950, borders were closed, some issue and incident was created, and eventually the Soviets were there always to bail out Afghanistan. When someone has had such a long history in a country, when from 1950 to 59, the dependence of Afghanistan and USSR on arms went from 0 to 100 percent, from petroleum products from 10 to 90 percent, total foreign trade from 17 to 50 percent. From throughout the 60s to 70s, you've had PDPA, the, this Khalek, Parcham, all these movements. When all of these things have been happening, when bridges have been built with the load limits of Soviet tanks in mind in, in Afghanistan, how can you suddenly just turn a blind eye and say, you know, okay, now with all these changes, we're just going to sit here and see what's, ha gonna, you know, what's going to happen next. I think that there's definitely a role to play in this region. They're not going anywhere. They were against Pakistan because we were an ally of China, because we were someone that was close with Americans. They have always been fearful of this pan-Islamic expansion in Central Asia. Well, radicalism has never been stronger in Pakistan or Afghanistan. They've never had this aspiration of IMUs and all these different groups who want to go north. They want to push everything in the south. Well, now it's possible that it might come up north. We've never been closer to China. We've never had a closer relationship with the U.S., you know, in this region also. So all of these factors, I think, I mean, if for the last 94 years you've been investing in something, how are you going to let this all go at a time like this when the threat has never been greater from what you were worried about back then? So I really feel that that's something that's going to be a factor here. Um, before ending, I just want to end on one last little point. I think it's just to give you the mindset of how Afghanistan is really a country of 25,000 village states which are semi-autonomous or a tribal confederacy instead of a central country. When Daud came back, after we talked about that time, 53 to 63, he was removed. When he came back in the 70s, one of the things he was doing was purging the organizations of this Khalq and this Pachami movement. In the Ministry of Interior, he moved the minister to become Minister of Education, and he took 160 of the most sort of, you know, Marxist, Leninist sort of thinkers in the ministry, brought them together, and he said, you know what? In order to spread this view and, you know, this right thinking, etc., you can't do it sitting in Kabul. You need to go out to the districts, and that's where it's all going to happen, etc. And he sends these 160 people out. He knew that they'd be out of communication with Kabul. He knew they'd be out of communication with themselves. And eventually, the whole thing died down because he knew the mindset of the mud curtain when you go out into the villages. Even this Ayan Amir, like King Abdul Rahman, never made examples of villagers or very restrictedly he did something in a particular village to humiliate someone because he recognized that the balance is very, very, you know, you have to be very careful with. So I think these are all factors that one must consider when we're looking at something like this Afghan election today. I mean, what are we looking at really? I mean, how fragmented is it? What is the frame of some of the people who are looking at this? Are they just looking at elections from 2001? Or do they know that parliamentary elections from 1931 to now have been going on? All these transitions have been going on. From King Abdul Rahman's time, the British were giving a stipend to Afghanistan. Then the Russians were. Then the Americans were. For 100 years, money's been coming from outside. So when we say, where's the money going to come? What's going to happen? For the last 100 years, it's been coming. I mean, if you look in the history also. So I think these are all factors to consider. Um, the region is something to consider. The pan-Islamic expansion, something to consider. And I'll just end with a little quote. Uh, actually, something that I wrote the other day. Um, there never have been any true winners of Afghanistan. There never will be. Only compromises and relentless maneuvering by her leaders, tribes, and neighbors. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Faisal, for that very uh, rich presentation, which covered a lot of ground. It's a good way of setting up a discussion, uh, starting with Claire. And I'm glad that uh, Faisal mentioned the National Solidarity Program, which, uh, as you know, uh, provides grants to 23,000 villages in Afghanistan. By any standard, it's one of the most successful things um, that the international community with our Afghan partners instituted. And Claire was one of the people who made it happen. So uh, Claire has played an instrumental role in uh, effective governance in Afghanistan. She's done a lot of thinking about it. Um, and uh, over to you. 
Thank you. Well, I'll start by thanking Peter and the New America Foundation for holding this event at such a momentous time in, in Afghanistan's history. Um, I'll reflect first specifically on the elections and then more broadly on the transition process and where Afghanistan might be heading. Um, to start with the elections, I think this is a real tribute to, to the Afghan people that the country is a few days away from its third presidential election. Um, much has been said about the different transitions, the security, the economic, the political, uh, but many have argued, I think rightly, that the political transition um, is the most important of these. Um, you know, the Hadley Podesta Task Force, Peter in his own writing, um, and, and a number of others. And I think the fact that it's happening on time and with such public involvement is, is something that perhaps a year ago people really would not have, have expected. Um, now, I'm assured by the technical experts, I'm not an election specialist, but I'm assured by those who are that the mechanics of the process are in place and that in itself is, is a tribute. Um, and this election compared to previous ones represents uh, sort of making the sort of mechanics um, domestically led. Um, but I think much more remarkable than the technical aspects are the political aspects. The, the, and as Faisal has documented, this real sense of public involvement, participation, and, and discussion across the country. Um, the, the sense that politics is being discussed in every household, not just in the urban areas, in the rural areas. Now, of course, media is playing an immense role in this. You know, the reach of radio and TV has enormous um, permeation across the, the countryside. Um, the number of public debates that have, that have been going on um, where I think all, all candidates have been participating. And not just that, the, the rallies that have been taking place where people in person, of course, um, given that political parties um, have something of a problematic history in Afghanistan, political parties are not the vehicle for policy formation. This is really done within the campaigns themselves. But the campaigns have been um, focusing as much on the uh, rural areas and across the countryside. There's no longer a sense that politics is confined to Kabul. Um, now, there are some, some risks we've, we've read and, and seen very sadly. There's been violence, there's been intimidation, and there's still a risk of fraud, um, although I'm, I'm assured that the controls are in place. Uh, and I think, though, that even with the um, you know, tragic departure of international monitors, there are, it, it, monitoring wasn't dependent on international monitors. There are many layers of monitoring, and most of these, that the bulk of the 300,000 um, expected monitors are the candidate agents themselves and monitor monitors that are run by um, Afghan organizations. Um, moving forward, and where some of the risks actually come from the fact that the Afghanistan still operates a cardboard um, uh, registration system. Uh, Dr. Ghani and I devoted, I think, several pages in our book, Fixing Failed States, to the need to, ha to move to a, a bio to use modern technology in registration, and that was back in 2004. When we argued that at the time, we were told by the UN that you couldn't switch to that because the cardboard had already been procured from a Canadian firm, and it would be um, it was too late and it would be a waste of the several million dollars spent on the cardboard <coughs> if you switched at that point. But they assured us that at the next election, they'd be able to move to the system. Um, we're now practically a decade further forward and we're still reliant on the system. I think you know, lessons learned for, for looking ahead um, to move to, to a biometric system is, is an opportunity. It's been done in India. It's being done in Yemen. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. So I think still there are some improvements that can be made. But, but in general, it seems that the process now is quite... Uh, robust. Um, but most of all, I mean, if we compare the, the three elections, the presidential elections, 04, 09, and 14, um, the real marker, certainly from where I sit and, and watching the country, seems to be this level of public participation and enthusiasm. And the real instrument of monitoring and accountability is going to be from the public themselves and what they're willing to, to tolerate. Now, what does this mean for the future direction of the country and what we see you know, after the, the event on this, this coming Saturday, the, the 5th of April, what, what will happen next? Um, I mean, I think you know, the first, what will we look to first is how do the leaders themselves, the institutions, the public get from how the votes are cast to a result? There may be a second round. Um, you know, there may be some questions of addressing fraud, there may not. Um, but looking beyond that, a question of whoever wins, how will that leader deal with the other groups and camps and form a team of people? And I think we've heard all of the, the, the candidates commit to forming a national team. And all of them, it seems, and, and they've recognized this, are going to need each other um, to govern. Um, so how they put that team together is going to be critical. And then more broadly, how do the key leaders and groups in society work together? Uh, there's been a paper that 
um, a number of leaders, in, including Dr. Ghani, but others have been discussing over the last few months and the National Dialogue pa paper. Um, as many Afghans said, look, we don't need a National Dialogue. It's what we're having every day. Um, but there was a process to begin to discuss these issues. And they identified that really the key political question for the country is how different groups in society across the country work together. And what's been really heartening about this process is that all of the tickets, are n none of them are reliant on a single group. They're all cross-ethnic. They've all committed to a national agenda. Um, so looking beyond the elections as event, and as, as many Afghans will, will tell me, it's the same in, in any country, you know, democracy isn't just about an event. Democracy is about the 364 days in between. And what's the type of governance and what type of institutions will be in place? And I think what this, this election represents is actually a real opportunity to move away from or move beyond what has been, I think, all too sadly, a, a technocratic approach to state building or nation building, um, to one that now really rests on public participation and where the politics of the country is what sets the, the direction of the country. And, and you know, what are the foundations for this? We've seen, um, as, as many have commented on the statistics, like many countries in the world, um, something like 70% of the country under 25, so a new generation of coming at, of age, and the kind of politics that they will shape is going to be really determinative. This media and the, and the reach of the media and the vitality of the media, um, another factor that will, will shape it. And I, d I think this public involvement that we're seeing isn't just a sudden occurrence. It's been building up over the last decade, um, not only with the presidential elections, but the parliamentary elections, the provincial councils, and as both Faisal and, and Peter have mentioned, the National Solidarity Program, um, <coughs> where uh, tens of thousands, I mean, I think it was, was 23,000, I think it's now increased to 31,000 um, villages have had village elections. And so this means that uh, I think 100,000 women have served as leaders in these um, village councils. And many of the provincial leaders and, and parli parliamentary leaders once served as leaders on the, on the village council. So they're bringing a politics that's rooted in the politics of the, of the, lo the locality. Um, so I think what, we, yes, what we're seeing is an evolution from this. Um, you know, if we look at a scorecard of where the country's been um, over the last decade, you know, what's rated quite highly in any kind of poll, if you look at the um, Asia Foundation polls, there's a lot of trust in the community development councils um, and very high public trust in the um, Afghan National Army, in the education system, in the health um, system. So the work of this technocratic agenda has had its dividends. It is playing a crown to the, um, the leaders, the Afghan government has been able to build institutions that, that work and are trusted by the people. You know, there are many problems as well, I mean, you know, much lower trust in the police, um, in the, the agriculture system has taken much, much longer to, to evolve. But it seems that the sort of low um, the, the problems in institution building have actually been in this area of accountability to the people and, and the public participation. So this is what might be set to, to change. Um, now, the tr transition that's been underway the last few years has been about shifting the burden of managing from international forces and, quite frankly, the international aid system to the domestic institutions. Um, so the question as we look forward sort of post these elections is how will the task of governing the country of bringing order and stability be rooted in the politics that will, will emerge? And I'll just end with some of the sort of critical factors that I think are going to be worth looking out for. The first is this question which I've alluded to is how will the leaders and groups in society agree to a new pact amongst themselves, a pact to govern? You know, how, what are the rules of the game? What's the direction of the country that they agree um, to, to move forward at, on? You know, these, this was actually the critical question that was discussed during the Bonn Agreement. How are the groups and factions within the country going to agree on how the country's governed? But that discussion took place in a room with just 40 people. Now it's taking place um, with, with millions. It's playing out in, in, the, in the homes of millions of people. Um, and, and you know, some of the key questions, which are central to all the campaigns, not just any one campaign, um, how are they going to secure their own country? Um, all of the key candidates have promised to sign the BSA, so I don't think that's in doubt. Uh, but how are they going to continue to build it on the um, Afghan National Army and the security forces? Um, a second measure that isn't discussed as often of this is how are they going to pay for the country? Um, one of the key measures of sovereignty, and it's very much this, this election represents the restoration of sovereignty, but one of the key measures of, of sovereignty is how a country pays for itself. And Afghanistan is, is a fair ways off being revenue self-sufficient. 
But this does mean the agenda of providing jobs across the country, something that um, citizens across the country are putting at the top of their agenda, but also raising the revenues, how the minerals, the oil and the gas discoveries are handled, and how Afghanistan moves as quickly as possible to paying for itself so that it's not reliant on the largesse of, of other taxpayers. And then I th the, 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 another critical question, how does this new government um, establish its own foreign policy? Um, its relations with its neighbors um, and their relation um, with the US. And then so finally, what does this mean for the type of support that this new government might be asking? I think it's a question of waiting and seeing. Um, and, and perhaps waiting a little bit longer than um, aid agencies and countries in the West like to wait. And, and I think it'd be really important to whoever wins um, to wait for a new government to form its um, set of priorities, its way of governing, and then configure a partnership, learning some of the hard lessons from the last decade. Thank you, Brad. Ambassador Samad. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I won't take too much time so we can have some time yeah. for an interaction. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentations. And I'm still a bit dizzy from Faisal's presentation. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to figure out exactly uh, how to approach that, but we can have that discussion some other time. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, the elections because we are five, six days away from a monumental uh, transition in Afghanistan. Uh, what's, what to expect? Uh, what are the barriers uh, and what are the obstacles? And uh, then obviously uh, what happens after post-election day, post-E-day as I called it in one of my articles. Uh, we. Uh, I think that it's the post-election period now that uh, is going to be absolutely essential and critical to validating all the efforts that have been put into this uh, major project um, and, and hopefully legitimizing it. Uh, so uh, let me start by saying that, first of all, Afghanistan is a very changed country. Um, it is not the, the Afghanistan of 2001. Uh, it is definitely not the Afghanistan of the 1930s uh, or other periods that you covered. Um, and it's not as tribal as some people really think. Uh, even tribalism in Afghanistan has taken on a new form. It is no longer the 19th century British definition or British perception of tribalism. Uh, you can see this today in action uh, during rallies that are taking place with tens of thousands of so-called tribals in the east and the west and the, well, the west and the north and the central part of Afghanistan have less tribes, as you know. Uh, it's mostly the Pashtun areas, the Pashtun belt of Afghanistan that is tribal. So uh, when the, with, the, with the growth of the, the youth population, uh, with empowerment of women, uh, you, you see definitely barriers shifting. You see change occurring on a uh, on a daily basis. And I, I think that uh, what you will see as a result of this election uh, are some mis, you know, misconceptions. Uh, there will be some, uh, there will be definitely a, a shift in generational uh, attitudes. I think that you will see uh, uh, as well some ethnic barriers being crossed by some of the uh, more uh, astute politicians and candidates and their teams. I think that you will see, uh, as I said, more youth and women uh, engaged in, in uh, change. Uh, and this is, this is all good. And this is uh, as a result of having gone through three decades of all, times, all types of turmoil, having learned a few lessons, um, having been the recipient of an amazing uh, contribution made by the international community over the last 13 years. Uh, not all spent well, uh, not all managed well, but overall um, life-changing. So uh, in my opinion, um, the, the, the picture overall is one of, is more positive than negative. And obviously as a critic of the Afghan government and as someone who spent 10 years working for that government, I, um, I cannot say that all the blame rests with one person or one institution or one country even. We all have a lot of uh, responsibility for what has happened, good and bad, over the last 13 years. Having said this, 
we have reached now the, a point where the era of the Bonn era, per se, that brought up Karzai uh, uh, is ending. Uh, and he obviously is playing his role in his game at, the, at, this, at this stage of history because he is very much concerned about his place in history. And he's very much concerned about the legacy that he leaves behind. And he does not want to be remembered as someone uh, that uh, came with the international community's blessing uh, and some Afghan assistance, uh, but also uh, was instrumental in continuing an international presence in Afghanistan. Uh, so this is why he's not signing the BSA. Um, but I am of the view that the BSA eventually will be signed once we have a new government in place. Um, so the state of elections, I mean, the elections has gone now for the, for the past year and a half or so, Afghans have been increasingly uh, embroiled uh, and engaged in uh, politics. Uh, I think that at this stage, a lot of people must, have, must be very tired of politics in Afghanistan. Uh, but Afghans have an ability to take a lot of politics and, do, and play a lot of politics. So <laughs> that uh, may continue. But what we do see is an amazing sense of enthusiasm that exists within the population, given the amount of, you know, the level of threats, the level of attacks that we have seen over the last few weeks, uh, we see amazing lines of people of, from all walks of life to this day wanting to get a voter's card. Uh, we don't know if this is the second or third voter card, but still, <laughs> we, we, do, we do see <laughs> that, uh, that, that they are lining up knowing that, you know, that there are attacks taking place. Uh, if you follow Afghan media, which is doing an amazing job of covering, an amazing job of presenting, an amazing job of promoting democracy at the grassroots level and, and engaging and bringing the candidates into people's living rooms, uh, you realize that uh, you know, we've, never, we've never had this before in, in, in Afghanistan. I mean, I come from a family that was very much involved in the 1960s politics and bringing democracy in the new constitution. And I remember those days when people did some campaigning in Kabul for, in, for, a, position in, for, a, for a, a position in parliament under the king. Uh, but it's nowhere near what is happening today, obviously. It's nowhere near that. So this is all uh, a, a very, um, very much appreciated change that is taking place. Um, what you also see is uh, what Claire mentioned is that these tickets, these, these tickets have been formed whether we like them or not, and whether, you know, whatever our preference might be. Uh, but they, they represent uh, sort of a, a national, they have a national flair to them. And they bring a national flavor to them. They are multi-ethnic in essence. Uh, some have problems with their composition. But overall, there is this realization that we have to work together. That whether you're a Pashtun or a Tajik or a Hazara, you know, the, the destiny of this country cannot be in the hands of just one group or one ethnicity, we all have to play our, our part. And, and so this is, again, something that is, or, or whether you were a former Mujahid or a former communist or a former royalist or a Democrat, whoever you may be, you are now part of a larger constituency and in in, you know, living under a new tent. And the only people left out of this tent are the guys who are trying to send suicide bombers and and sending rockets and, and maiming people and so on and so forth. And so, but the rest of the Afghan family, if we can, we can call it that, has come <coughs> under this tent. We have our disagreements, we have our likes and dislikes, we, we have uh, you know, our different uh, uh, agendas and mentalities, but that's how it is, isn't it? That's how it should be. And so we are moving towards this, and the, and the challenge will be to continue and sustain this movement. And the challenge will be to make sure that we do not regress, and to make sure that we can do everything possible uh, uh, to give the next generation the tools and the means and the resources to continue. And so and the, this next generation already has been um, acclimatized. This new next generation already has been uh, globalized, something that did not, was not the case in 2001 or, or, or pr prior to that. And so this. These, these millions of, new, of young Afghans 
most of whom are going to, over the age of 18, are going to vote for the first time, and who probably do not remember much of what was happening in the 1990s or 80s, or even during Taliban time, they are the ones who are looking, who are going to be the agents of change. So this is all very good. The other thing that is very important today is the sense of defiance. There is, there is very strong civic resistance to the imposition by force and by, or through violence of wanting to derail this process. And I think that the Afghans are not picking up arms to do this. To this. The Afghans are doing it by speaking out, by rallying, by demonstrating, by coming. I mean, it's amazing to see these people come on, on TV and say, to hell with you, Taliban or Mullah Omar or whoever you are, and you're not going to stop me. I am going to go and vote. This is the message that is, that is resonating over the past couple of weeks across the country, especially, of course, in the major cities. Um, let me talk a little bit about the polling, because I think this is a, an issue that has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, there have been five polls, if I'm not mistaken, that have been taken uh, over the last couple of two, three months, uh, trying to uh, evaluate public opinion in Afghanistan uh, about elections and about the candidates and the tickets. The latest one wa came out two days ago by uh, ATR, based out of Dubai, uh, which seems to be the most controversial so far. Uh, and there uh, has raised a lot of questions in some quarters. Some people have liked it and some people have not. Obviously, that is the case with polls usually. <laughs> uh, but, but it does, to some extent, show a certain trend. And but with one caveat, polling in, in Afghanistan is not a scientific matter. It is very difficult to have a very accurate or a even a, a somewhat accurate reading of public opinion in Afghanistan, regardless of who's ahead and who's not. I think what we are going to see on election day, if these elections are managed and administered somewhat properly, somewhat ac according to rules, and there is no major meddling and tampering with elections, I think that what you're going to see is a lot of surprise for people. I think that um, a, a person who may today be in, in, in a certain position will end up somewhere else, and someone who's high up may turn out to be somewhere else. I think that we are in for, for a lot of surprises if elections are uh, managed according to, to the rules. Uh, and if results are, are tabulated according to rules. So, uh, so the polls, and I don't want to go into the technicalities, but the polls have one benefit. The benefit is that it, ha it does demonstrate a certain trend. But one should not be beholden to, to the polls and the, to numbers until uh, you know, elections take place themselves. Because there are definitely some problems with coming up with a sample, uh, making sure that that sample is representative, making sure that there are a lot of issues that, come, come, uh, that are associated with polling and with the, the methodology itself. Let me say a couple of words about security. As I said, you know, there is an attempt to derail elections. Uh, the Afghan government, of course, uh, points the finger at certain elements in Pakistan. Uh, it is pretty clear that these elements are coming from Pakistan, but we also know that the safe havens are in Pakistan. We also know that the, the training of suicide bombing takes place in Pakistan. But who is involved in Pakistan with all of this is another question. Uh, you know, we can talk about this at length, but we may not reach any conclu conclusions. But there is, a, there is, again, what we do have is a history and a trend going back to certain state elements in Pakistan who have, uh, oh, since the 1990s, uh, 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 who have supported and have promoted this, this, radical, this radical thinking and, um, and have su been supportive of groups such as the Taliban and, and others. But as was mentioned earlier today, Pakistan itself is facing an existentialist threat at the hands of the same people. Because as far as Afghans are concerned, there are no good or bad Taliban. They all come from the same kindergarten, whatever <laughs> you want to call it, or preschool or school. But the madrasa system is that has been in place since the 1980s is the production line for this type of 
schooling and, mental, and, and, and mindset. So the, the threat, whether to Pakistan or to Afghanistan, uh, is the same. Uh, the rhetoric is somewhat different. The politics behind it may be different. But the strategies may end up being the same. A little bit about uh, fraud. Uh, f uh, there is an expectation that there will be fraud. No one should, you know, should uh, be disillusioned by the fact that, uh, that the Afghan election process is going to be all clean and fair. Uh, but it's just, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, a, it's a question of the level of fraud. Is this going to be industrial scale fraud? Or is this going to be home uh, level fraud? Is this going to be local and small scale fraud? Because if it is going to be widespread industrial scale fraud, uh, I think that uh, this is going to jeopardize uh, the whole process. It's going to uh, threaten uh, even political stability to some extent. Uh, and it will make it much harder for uh, what Claire was referring to earlier, uh, in terms of coming up uh, with a national team. It is going to become much more problematic. But what is very important is that the first, at least the first round of elections do take place, that there be no horse trading or compromise before the Saturday, this coming Saturday. Uh, and if they are, that, you know, that it shouldn't determine the outcome of elections. The Afghan people are owed this in terms of their rights to be able to go and cast their votes and for their votes to make a difference. And then I think after the first round, depending on who the top two contenders will emerge and who, will, who they will be, then I think there is an opening, there's a window of opportunity for, I hope, you know, statesmen to see how they could maybe work together. And if they can come up with a formula that works and that is acceptable, uh, I think that you will see Mr. Karzai also some be, be more comfortable with it. Uh, you will see also uh, the contenders, the main, the main players, and their constituencies also agree to it. Uh, so the hope is that uh, after elections, uh, there will be a a rethink on how to safeguard the gains of the last 13 years, how to come up with a stronger governance team and a, a, a more effective leadership in the country, uh, more forward thinking, and hopefully also a leadership that can eventually at some point be in a position to deal with the Taliban and those who support them. May I stop here? And then Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm clear. I've just had some quick questions myself, so we have limited time, but I wanted to get some clarifications. One, you mentioned the five polls uh, that have happened, um, and they consistently show that Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Ghani are sort of the front runners. Um, is ATR the polling company that has done all five of those polls? No. Okay. So, I mean, the burden of the polls suggests, even if there is imperfect methodology and getting the right sample is a problem, that they are the front runners. Uh, yes, but, but one has to take into account uh, what has happened over the last two weeks. Uh, since Kayum Karzai left, uh, you know, uh, left the, the race and joined Zamai Rasul, and since um, the, the, the campaign has picked up quite tremendously, uh, this the last poll goes to March 25th or 6th, I think, which is last week, but still. Uh, covers a period where there is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It's not very there's no clarity on some results. And then the methodolo methodology, I think, is also very important. Okay, but Rasul, who is supposed to be the Karzai preferred candidate in the most recent poll, got eight percent. I think is that correct? Seven seven point five. Yes. Okay, so I mean, he's not doing that well, relatively speaking. According to this poll. According to this poll. Um, by the way, there's been polling in Afghanistan since 2005 and uh, by all sorts of people. And one of the most consistent findings is that there is never a more than a 10% favorable view of the Taliban. Do you accept that? Yeah, I do. I, I tend to accept, because it's a very common view that polling in Afghanistan, it, I, I don't understand, for instance, why polling in Pakistan is perfectly predictive 
which has many of the same problems that Afghanistan has, and why in Afghanistan it's not predictive. I, I understand it may not be exactly as it, as it is in the States, but it's a very common, kind, of, kind of common view that polling in Afghanistan doesn't work. I don't buy that, because I think that we, and you use the word trend, you know, very consistently we've seen in polling a rejection of the Taliban, a very high uh, uh, favorable view of the army, which Claire mentioned, a very disfavorable view of the police. All of this kind of accords with what we know anecdotally. Um, so I, I think these polls are going to turn out to be closer to the truth than we may think. Uh, but one of the big surprises here, and maybe Claire or, or Omar, you can answer this, is you know, uh, Dr. Ghani's previous uh, election campaign was sort of like the, like the um, I mean, he was such an outlier. He got, what, 2%? And why is he doing so well at this time? Is it, is it about Dostum? Is it about first? Ambassador, this to you. I'll, I'll recuse myself from this. Well, okay. I, uh, I mean, I, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Ghani has spent the last five years uh, exposing himself to the public and, 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 and interacting very closely at the grassroots level. Uh, he realized that he needed to uh, appeal to the population across the board, and he took on a national uh, sort of uh, a, a, a pro project to work on. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, he obviously is, is a, a part of his support is coming from General Dostum. Uh, so that, that is a voter bank that, uh, that he can rely on very strongly. Um, and, and I think that he, he, his rhetoric is different, his, his political narrative is, is different than, than, it's much more encompassing and in, in, um, uh, in national in scope. Uh, so those may be some of the reasons, uh, but again, uh, we, 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 we will know when... What do, you think turnout, what do you think turnout will be? I mean, I've seen numbers of 60 to 70 percent, is that plausible? If security situation on April 5th is not out of control, yeah. then I think that the 60 to 70 percent is plausible. Yeah. By the way, just a small note, which, uh, you know, the last time there was a 70 percent turnout in a presidential election in this country was in 1900, uh, just for a sort of useful way of comparison. Um, do you think Karzai has actually done everybody a favor by not signing the BSA? Because after all, the man who will sign this BSA, and will be a man, obviously, um, will be somebody who's not the America's candidate. It will be somebody who has won an electoral process, um, who hasn't, you know, it, it's a completely new person. Because in this town, I mean, there's a lot of thing, discussion about, well, you know, it's terrible that Karzai isn't signing. I actually think it's a good thing that he hasn't signed it. Oh. Any thoughts? I think, I mean, I'm instinctively, I'm, I'm with you on that one. It's, it seems, just, just from a logical perspective, that um, given that this will be a key part of the next president's foreign policy, um, committing the next president, well, for allowing the next president to have that as part of his foreign policy and hold him accountable to that w makes enormous sense. By the way, can you explain uh, something that's always puzzled me, which is there is a huge disconnect between the, what I would call the Afghan expert community, people on this stage, and many of the people in this room, and how they see Afghanistan and the prospects for both kind of not having a massive civil war in 2015 and a relatively successful election, and the disconnect between that and why rel relatively well-educated Americans who aren't necessarily expert think that Afghanistan is going to hell in a handbasket. There, there may be some uh, <coughs> uh, imagery from Iraq yeah. to some extent. Uh, I think that there's also, uh, there's, there hasn't been enough uh, reporting on the positive uh, in Afghanistan. The focus has been a lot over the last two, three years on Karzai and what he said and what he hasn't said and what he's done and not done and not enough on what is happening with people's daily lives. Yeah, so what's going to happen is going to be people, to the extent that they're paying attention about Afghanistan, on Monday when they start reading the papers about turnout, the lack of violence, a relatively small amount of fraud, are going to be pleasantly surprised perhaps. We hope. Agree. Yeah. Okay, questions. Anybody who has a question, raise your arm. And uh, identify yourself, this gentleman here. Wait for the microphone. Thanks. My name is uh, Mohsen Kamal, and I'm a lawyer working in an international law firm here in the Washington, D.C. office. My questions from the panel, particularly Faisal and Mr. Ambassador Yu. 
you told us about like there are many autonomous factors like there is a young youth of Taliban 25 years old guys those who are pretty much controlling the ground there and then they have the Quetta Shura or the Mullah Omar and the old hunchman and then we have like a complete Pakistan factor to the equations and then there's an election do you think this election will generate that much of a political capital for the winner and that much of a political will within the Afghan people leaving Taliban not the tribal areas to pull them or coerce them into some kind of a submission toward the Afghan constitution? Is there any historical precedent? I mean, you have a good eye on the Afghan history. Has it ever happened before in the Afghan history? And what do you see from the ground perspective now? Thank you. Um, whether the Taliban will recognize the current this bond agreement constitution or what may be yeah, what will there be chances of no civil war after this election will Taliban accept the demands uh, the, the constitutional demands or political demand of the new government after the election I think that this this is really depends on the like I mentioned earlier the integrity of the process of what it will be and how this dialogue will take place I don't see that there's any civil war or doomsday. I, I'm very positive on the future, uh, both in Afghanistan as well as in the border areas um, going forward. Um, in terms of what you said about historically, has there been any example? Um, just something that comes to mind quickly, there's, uh, there's nothing that comes to my mind, but maybe Ambassador Saab might have something to add to that. Well, let, let, let me, I think that uh, I also believe that there's not going to be a civil war uh, and that um, depending on how, what kind of mandate the new government is going to have. Is it going to be a strong government, a unified government, a, a very strongly representative government, or is it going to be a weak government? The stronger the government, the better the chances over a long period of time to deal with the Taliban. The, sh the, the weaker the, the, the government, as has been the case over the last few years actually, uh, the harder for us to to be able to uh, come to some type of settlement with the Taliban. Uh, the impact of elections on the Taliban uh, is very difficult to discern, but I think uh, that um, we already see that there are elements within the Taliban who have either been eliminated, ousted, uh, or, or sidelined, uh, who have second thoughts. So that, that is now clear. There are Taliban with second thoughts. And to what extent, but they are not in charge, and they are not operational. So uh, this is why there's no momentum on the peace front. Uh, whether there will be more rifts within the Taliban, that's one question. And to what direction? More radicalization, more jihadi thinking, or more moderation? That's one question. The other question is, what role will Pakistan play? in those within Pakistan who have supported one trend or the other. And so once you have an answer for those two questions, I think that the role of the new Afghan government will be made much easier depending on their strength. I just an observation here. I think the United States misconceived. We thought the reconciliation process was with the Taliban. The real reconciliation, re reconciliation process is a successful election, mm -hmm. which includes everybody. Mm -hmm. And we put so much, so much of our mental effort into something that was, I think, always a fool's errand. Yeah. And here we have a, you know, an election that's going to proceed, and that will be the national reconciliation process in which the Taliban have basically absented themselves. By the way, speaking of the Taliban, uh, Faisal, do you think, and if somebody who's a, almost a native of Waziristan, but not quite, uh, but just across the border, do you think the Pakistani military is going to do this operation in North Waziristan, which is the toughest, not militarily? Um, yes, and the two, three indicators why I'd say yes is because traditionally whenever there's been a military intervention in the area, there have always been certain passes and areas that have been left open or unmanned where people have traditionally moved forward into Arakzai and other places. This last time, all the places were blocked. The second thing is that low-level ground commanders like Asmatullah Shaheen and others who previously are not on the national screen or anything else but key in terms of military operation of anti-state actors they were assassinated mm -hmm. in North Pakistan and surrounding to try and also indicate that we can also do this over here right now if you want to. So 
So I think those were some indications which allowed people to to see that there was actually some impetus in the in the operation, and there's there is seems to be support amongst the people also. Great, uh, Harun Ula here from the State Department. This gentleman over here. Yeah, Harun. Oh, thank you, thank you, panelists. Uh, Mushtaq Akhwa from Imam Shirazi <laughs> Foundation here in Washington D.C. A quick question: Is uh, the election in Afghanistan all inclusive? Or is it just the first time to have an election that's pronounced so well? Is all inclusive the, within the minorities of Afghanistan, or is it just an election that so far it's it's a U.S. signature of Afghanistan? Which one would you think it is? Well, meaning that there will be universal participation by all ethnic groups. Is that the question? Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all indications point to a very strong groundswell. Uh, an inclusive inclusivity and participation by all um, all social, political, ethnic, religious groups. I don't. I, I, I haven't come across any one. With the, again, with the exception of those who say we are Taliban, we are against the process. There may be some pro-Taliban who will vote on election day, mm -hmm. and there will be some pro-Taliban who will try to disrupt it. Um, but I haven't come across anyone uh, other than these spoilers who have been left out or who feel that they are not part of the uh, process. Quick question for you, Ambassador Saman. What, um, whether it's a Ghani government or an Abdullah government or whatever it is in uh, the end of the year, um, what do you think their attitude will be to uh, participation of Taliban in the political process, i.e., um, would they be amenable to Taliban district governorships or provincial governorships? What is the level of acceptance of a role for the Taliban? Uh, I can't speak for these candidates, yeah. but my, my, from what we, we have heard them uh, say over the past, or during the campaign at least, this, yeah. this issue has come up quite a bit, is that they will rethink the process first. Mm. They, are going, they are not going to continue with the, the, this current process that Karzai started. So there's going to be some review, first of all, of how are we approaching peace and reconciliation. And, um, and they want to shore it up, and they want to strengthen the process. Mm. And I think that uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it has a lot of flaws, and so. Okay, well, yeah. would one fix, and that we mm -hmm. all agree the Afghan constitution and was then, yeah. done in a hurry and wasn't mm -hmm. really thought through, would one very big fix, and, and to what extent have candidates talked about this, be direct elections for governorships? So that yeah. So, so if Abdullah's plan is implemented, uh, that means that people in localities will have a chance to vote their local governor. Right. Now, that local governor could end up being a Taliban. But if the central government is going to make the appointments, as has been the case thus far, so obviously national politics will come into play and it's going to be a different ballgame. But Abdullah is one of his, he's campaigning on this issue as one of the Yes, yes. Anybody else? Well, others have <coughs> indicated, uh, like Dr. Ghani, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Ghani has indicated that he's going to review everything and he's going to see what works best and he's going to give time for reform to take place. Even this whole question of a parliamentary system and moving towards a parliamentary system, I think Dr. Ghani was the one who said, well, in year three or four, I'm going to call Eloy Jerga and I'm going to put this to them as to whether you want to amend the constitution and create the position of a prime minister mm. in the country. So they all have uh, a certain plan uh, to, uh, for devolution, if you want to call that. Okay, let's collect some questions here. The lady uh, and then the gentleman in front of him. Yes. Um, I'm with um, Deb Reekman with Associated Press. Just generally, what do you think the U.S. policy should be going forward post-election? And secondly, more specifically, do you think that the U.S. should play a role in any kind of reconciliation work that's going to continue? Anyone in particular? Anyone? Oh, uh, let, let me just say, uh, as an Afghan, let me just say that the U.S. Uh, has, uh, over the last few weeks, uh, had a very hands-off attitude. Um, low-key position on uh, elections, which is good, uh, uh, and neutral, which is what it should be. Uh, at the same time, post-elections, I think that the U.S. and the international community, uh, while election results are being tabulated, have to remind everyone, including people in Afghanistan, that there are rules to abide by. 
and that they, they have, you know, this whole process has to end up with a somewhat relatively legitimate, credible, acceptable outcome. Number one. Number two, the U.S. should definitely make a case for continued support to Afghanistan, standing by its commitments made in Tokyo, in Chicago, in Bonn over the last two, three years. And uh, even the possibility of President Obama coming up finally and giving a troop number, a number for residual troops to be uh, considered in Afghanistan once BSA is signed. Uh, the gentleman here uh, who is in front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fawad Lamy from Voice of America Afghan Service, and uh, my question is from uh, Ambassador Samad. Uh, well, uh, what is your take on uh, Mr. Ali Khan's uh, assessment of the situation in Afghanistan, especially uh, my, his uh, last conclusion that he said uh, there, uh, there never have been nor will be a true winner in Afghanistan? Thank you. Well, I'm still dizzy. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no offense. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's because it was very rich. Uh, um, the, uh, I think that uh, Afghanistan uh, does not have a Western style or Western concept of winning and losing. I think that uh, in Afghan society, you, you do have winners and losers. And we're moving more and more towards more legitimate winners and losers. And so the whole issue is, where are you on this tra trajectory of change and development and, and, and progress? And we are still at the beginnings of it. So I, I believe that Afghanistan has, is on the right track. It has just experienced some bad moments due to a lot of different causes. But we are going to have legitimacy determine winners and losers. And that is the most important thing. I just like to clarify, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what I meant with, with what I said over there is that it's, that it's always compromises that come up in the end. So whenever there's an end result, it's more of a compromised result as opposed to any one particular view. It's like in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman over here with... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is, each of the candidates seems to have their own individual strengths and weaknesses. Uh, given the ones who don't end up uh, winning, um, what type of role do you en envision for them in the government? Will they still be involved in some way? For example, with uh, Sayyaf, will he still be used to condemn and delegitimize the Taliban's arguments? And on that same note, what kind of vision do you, um, do you see for Karzai's role in the future, given, let's say there's a candidate that's not really amenable to working with him or using him as an advisor or consultant? How will, he, how will that shape out? Good questions. Who wants to take it? I'm asking <laughs> a doctor. Um, you know, I, I, it's very difficult, first of all, to predict what might happen and how, how things might shape, shape up and, and who might uh, take on what role. And, and so uh, with that caveat, I, I think that uh, what you're going to see is uh, an attempt. At least, I think there will be an attempt uh, by the front runners, uh, even those who may be losing in the first round, to uh, create what was, was, what was, I think, you called uh, as, uh, as a national go government. And, and so I think that there will be, a, through by use of compromise, as you mentioned, so there will be compromise made, political compromise, to create something more powerful, more uh, representative. Um, because the tickets that are running right now have their flaws, have their pluses and minuses. As you mentioned, you know, they have their strengths and weaknesses. And I think that by bringing some of them together, you are creating a, a, a stronger uh, uh, core. And that is what is needed, a stronger core. And that cannot happen now. It has to happen after the first round. And I hope that uh, they will do, so, do it in a, in a, in a somewhat open, uh, transparent, and hopefully uh, very legitimate manner, uh, first of all. And secondly, uh, I think that in the case of uh, other leaders, like Mr. Sayoff, as you mentioned, I think they all have a role to play 
you know, all, every Afghan has a role to play eventually, hopefully for uh, a role, a, a role that is constructive and positive. Um, and in case of Mr. Karzai, uh, I have been on the record saying that he needs to be um, given his due place. I think that he needs to uh, have a, be given immunity. Uh, I think that he, he, he needs to be uh, given a title and maybe even um, helped as you know, join a sort of council of elders, maybe, uh, um, and work on certain causes that he personally l would like to work on. So, so he can continue to play a constructive, unifying role. And, and whoever can play a unifying role in Afghanistan, uh, I, in my opinion, is going to be regard, highly regarded by people, even if they've made mistakes in the past. Uh, just a couple of additional comments. One from earlier on the question of um, the changes to the Constitution and decentralization. One of the, I think, sort of hidden facts is when, when one reads the Constitution, it actually mandates election, municipal elections. And it's just never been implemented. So there's actually a lot more decentralization and so on. So one of the questions, I think, for any, <laughs> any future leader is, is the Constitution itself going to be implemented even before it's changed? Um, in terms of how other candidates might join or not, I think you know, that's going to be a question of how the candidates or whoever wins forms the compromises, and especially if it goes to a second round or there's a question of where it does. I know that it's, the media has reported that Ghani has said that if he should form a an administration, he would invite all the other candidates to join the, that administration. Um, I don't know if the others have, have made similar pledges. And I think that there's a, what seems to be from this national dialogue discussion that's been going on, one of the central parts of this was a recognition that a key marker of this election is going to be treating the current incumbents with, with dignity and, and respect, um, especially given you know, the, the tragic ends that have befallen past rulers, and that, that it's really incumbent on, on all the candidates to afford him um, that dignity and, and a role going forwards. Quick factual clarification. He's building his retirement house on the presidential palace grounds. Is that no. true? No, it's no. outside. It's next door to the presidential palace. But <laughs> close enough? Yes. Close right. enough for what? Uh, you know, just to drop <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a um, lot more questions. So we're going to just, we're running, we're already over time, but let's bunch some of them up. Uh, Tyler will go with this lady over here first, and then we'll just collect questions after her. Thank you. I'm Deborah Alexander, and I was nine years in Afghanistan as advisor for USAID and Department of State. Quick questions, too. I've been intrigued with watching that several of the slates had have women vice presidential candidates and also that Mrs. Ghani has been fairly active in campaigning. How have Afghans responded to this presence of women uh, on the both candidate slates and as, um, as a campaigner, if you will? And then my other question is, is if any of you are willing to predict if there will be a runoff? Thank you. I think the answer to that is yes. Okay, um, this, this, guy, this gentleman here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Muhammad Hussein Akhlaqi. I am from Afghanai Geo and Mining Engineering Services. A few days ago, I came from Kabul. My question is to uh, Ambassador Saib. Uh, right now, many businesses in Afghanistan is in hold. What do you think that uh, signing the BSA and uh, the election can affect uh, the improvement of the business and private sectors? The answer to that is yes as well. <laughs> okay, this gentleman here. Hi, Doug Brooks with the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, again, on the BSA question, one of the issues that the U.S. military point, U.S. and, and international militaries have made is that the decision needs to be make, made sooner rather than later if they're to stay in with any sort of presence. Um, if, the, if the size is to be scaled down, I mean, how much of a presence do, do you see uh, would need to remain? Anybody else? This gentleman here, and then we'll wrap it up. It's a uh, red hair. Um, my question is about state-local interactions after the election. Um, I think in South Asia over the last 150 years, we've seen a lot of problems with um, ethnic categorization through census, through ID cards, elections, et cetera. Um, so what do you think is necessary 
for a shift in rural areas from uh, prioritizing local conditions to a more national sense of, of um, Afghanistan is not just a land for the Pashtuns, but for, for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me just take a few of those. Uh, on the women's issue, yes, three of the tickets uh, still running have female VPs on them, uh, uh, including Zamay Rasul. And uh, this is a step forward for women in Afghanistan, and they have been very active uh, uh, in the campaigns. Uh, they, they have traveled almost everywhere without any restrictions. They have traveled to the south, where they have traveled to the north, everywhere. Uh, and they speak uh, up very openly. And, and I, as I mentioned earlier, women participation is going to grow this time around, definitely more than uh, past elections, uh, which is all very good. Um, runoff, my prediction, uh, as Peter said, is most probably yes. Uh, business in BSA, BSA will solve mo most, many of the business problems that exist today if it's signed. They, it, they, you know, it has had a psychological impact and also security has, has also uh, hurt businesses. Uh, as of two, three days ago, all restaurants have been ordered to shut down in Kabul until elections take place, for example. Uh, and BSA sooner or later, and how many, uh, I think that the, 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 the administration here uh, by now has an idea as, as to what this timeline looks like. And the view is that anywhere between eight to 10,000 is the minimum required by the US, plus whatever NATO contributes to, to this uh, pool. Um, I'll leave the rest for the others. Oh. Um, on the business one, I just like to say that you know the the chambers are very active. They, Afghanistan has a signatory to the TIR, which means movement of goods, in, you know, without transit over there. They've got a lot of things that are in you know in place. I think American businesses really should come in and invest more. I mean, you used to have that Peter Baldwin who ha owned Ariana Airways as an entrepreneur back in the day in Pan Am. And you know, if there's actual American businesses that are coming in and doing that, that would be very good. I saw that came across some JP Morgan people doing some mining with Said Mansoor Nadri's son's group and things like that. So that itself is a good indicator. Smaller businesses, one didn't come across much. And when you ask people how much is the chicken cost or what is the cost of the milk, the open one kilo milk, lots of people don't even know, like in the, the bigger people, what these things cost or what they are. So I didn't see that there was a lot in terms of domestic economy. People would take paychecks and be looking at other places to invest because of not having that faith in what's going to happen next. But there's a lot of positive things. There's construction everywhere in the outlying areas and things, which is you know very positive. On the women thing, I wanted to also mention that I met some young women MPs and other people who were out campaigning, canvassing. There were people everywhere. Um, and as Ambassador Saab mentioned, even in the rural areas, I mean, it's something that's um, you know, you come across a lot more than you probably did in the past. One more thing quickly about elections is that, you know, elections is also a great time. There's free meals, there's activity, there's transport, you're going around as a hala gulla, you know, it makes a, it creates a sort of atmosphere also, which gets everyone into the mood and all that kind of thing, which has happened, you know, all, all uh, across the country. And I think that as once we we're over this, there'll probably be people looking towards, as there's more of a withdrawal, local business opportunities and things that people can look at. Um, on the prediction of a, of a runoff, I think if the polls are right, then a second round is, is certainly on the cards. But the question is whether, you know, sh should it go to a second round? Will that sec second round be held or will there be the type of compromises that the, the panel has been talking about? Um, on the businesses, I mean, I think it would seem to be, and certainly from talking to, to business um, owners, um, you know, from the country, it's it's not so much that the, whether the BSA is resolved, but the question of resolving the election and determining what's the sort of um, what's the shape of the next government and what are their policies going to be? How business friendly are they? How are they going to be able to bring the confidence, um, you know, continue the confidence, and project that confidence? Um, and then on the state local interactions, I think it's, it's all, you know, as in any country, it's a balance between having a countrywide national agenda and then tailoring the responses to the particular areas. And it's programs like NSP that I think have managed to do that. So everybody has access to NSP, but it's a mechanism that allows the um, policies to address the particular needs, but it's a fair form 
formula that everybody can see that nobody's getting more than the others of their share without some, some criteria of fairness. Thank you, Claire Lockhart, Faisal Ali Khan, Ambassador Samad. That was a brilliant presentation by all concerned. Thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully it will be a good, good election. Thank you. Thank you.